is Lisa Sanditz and I'm an artist living and working in my studio in the Hudson Valley and I also teach painting and ceramics and drawing at Bard College. So I do a lot of painting, a lot of landscape painting. Um, more recently I've also done some sculptures, mostly ceramic based and then often incorporating found objects that I find in the landscape. Um, so I, I do, I get a lot of inspiration from site visits. Um, so often I'll hear about an interesting or problematic location and go visit that site and collect information there, whether it's visual or sights or sounds or other stories from people that I meet there, colors um, in, in the location, and then often make drawings as well as take some photographs and then bring that information back to the studio and kind of synthesize it and then um, maybe a painting will result right away or maybe like years later that painting kind of that information digests and I'm able to make a painting. I think in terms of my paintings I think about the sublime now kind of coming out of the 19th century idea of the sublime in terms of coming into contact with a landscape or an event that is both terrifying and beautiful and awe-inspiring and really kind of uh, having a visceral reaction to that. And for me, I've experienced that certainly in the natural landscape, but more so I would say in landscapes that are more agitated, where there is maybe a, quite an expanse of landscape, but also something happening on such an incredibly large scale, especially I think in terms of factories in China, visiting some factories that employ 60,000 people, which is the size of a sizable city in the United States. I think that kind of combination of where the landscape has been altered in some regard, you know, just various ways of finding like tension within the paint and the colors and the paint application and the canvas, manipulating scale, manipulating vantage points. So thinking about some kind of disorientation in the painting as that kind of space can be disorienting and also not taken in at once. My favorite coal painting and certainly most inspired, inspiring painting for me is the um, Course of Empire cycle. You know, I think a lot about the landscape in terms of its reflection of um, our cultural values, things that are problematic, things that are glorious. Um, and I think I find a lot of inspiration from his, that cycle of paintings too. And I think a lot of the same concerns in terms of maybe something that's a more natural environment that's romanticized, like in the, um, the painting Savage State or the pastoral or Acadian State painting, and then the you know, possible exuberance and problems of development that his the sort of middle paintings do. And then how they sort of point to demise. And I think that that course of empire, which he was talking about then, I think we're still, we're in a new phase of a course of empire that's possibly going to self-destruct. On the other hand, those are such sort of like fully realized, you know, giant epic allegorical paintings. I am also attracted to, and I can't give you one by name, but just the studies, a lot of the field studies I've seen of his, or just studies for paintings, or something about those that are so loose and fresh. Um, and I think that that, they're also more kind of modern, the way that we sort of, the loose brushwork that we um, have more sort of capability of using um, at this point, where I mean, painting can be a lot of things now, but certainly that sort of looseness and freedom from realism is really evident in those, in his studies. And then, you know, like I said, I think the paintings, especially allegorical paintings, even though the some stylistically, they're pretty um, typical of 19th, late 19th century painting, mid late 19th century painting, um, I still think a lot of those ideas hold true in terms of development and migration patterns and um, our sort of relationship to the environment we live in. Another thing for me specifically, my interest in his work and sort of the relationship to this region, so like I said, I've done a lot of landscape paintings and some people know, maybe know that I've also, I've painted a lot of American landscape paintings, but also I've done a body of work based on industrial Chinese landscape and that, I even came to that by 
being in this area and seeing a barge that was carrying junked cars up to, to that were trash um, up the Hudson River, and just being in this kind of post-industrial environment near the Erie Canal and all of these um, factory towns that are abandoned near here, um, it got me thinking about where is industry now? And that kind of led me to this five-year kind of investigation of an industrial landscape in China. So even my paintings that were of as far of places as one could think of were kind of connected to the environment here. And more specifically, these single industry towns that produce something and the town was named after what the item they produced was visiting places like Gloversville, New York, where they used to pr produce gloves and Tannersville, where they would tan leather for gloves. And then those places are not very industrial anymore, somewhat, but not really. Um, and going to places like Shoe City, Sock City in China. So making that connection between, you know, the very local and the very global at the same time. So some of the newer paintings I've been working on. So the painting behind me is a painting um, actually that I painted a view from the Amtrak train going down to New York City along the Hudson River. It's a painting of the Palisades. So the Palisades has this, this history too of this kind of preserved view shed, envir environmentally preserved place. Which is great. It was a lot of it was preserved as a view for the rich, but it was still, um, you know, great to kind of preserve this this location. And and then in these newer paintings, I've also been thinking about what maybe not just what we see in the landscape, but what happens below the surface. And so I've been building up the paintings with layers of paint and then sanding back into them to reveal these kind of bits of color underneath. As I think of uh, and read about. Um, microplastics and toxins in the environment that are kind of actually coloring the water with these like tiny plastic rainbow particles that are becoming a problem in the water too. So the thing about the landscape is something we see but that there's obviously a lot more happening underneath too as a result of our presence there.